Good afternoon and welcome to another opportunity for a midweek Bible study online. I appreciate so much you guys tuning in. Thank you so much for the kind comments and likes and shares that you've been providing. I appreciate that so much and it's very encouraging to see all of you uh, interact with us in, in this manner and in, in the midst of all kind of chaos that's going on outside. We've definitely uh, enjoyed the opportunity to be able to reach out to some folks that we haven't before, some folks that probably hadn't heard from in a little while. And thank you so much for, for making that possible by your attention, by your ability and, and willingness to be able to reach out to other folks. Thank you so much for this past first day of the week. We had our first uh, parking lot service and I was so excited and I know there's several folks that were here who were excited too to be able to at least see each other through the windshields and windows of cars and thank you so much for that we're going to again to plan Lord willing to do that again this Sunday to try to keep everybody safe as we can but I'll be able to interact with one another and we're so thankful for Chris and for all the the, the men who are helping to make that possible thank you to all those guys who who have volunteered their time to be able to help to, to lead singing, to lead prayers, and, and to help us to be able to put that on. Thank you guys so much for, for those things. Before we begin our Bible study this afternoon, let's start with a word of prayer, and then we're going to get started with this. If you would, please, let's go to the Father in heaven, and then we're going to start looking at a very wonderful Bible character. Let's pray. Our Holy Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for an opportunity. In times such as this, we have your truth, and we're thankful for that truth and how much it still so very much applies to us today. And Father, as we study thy word this evening, we pray, Father, that you'll help us to be able to rightly divide that truth. And we pray, Father, that you'll... Um, be able to give those things to us so that we, and also pray that we'll be willing to listen. We'll be willing to make those applications to our lives. And we just pray, Father, it's not just for academic purposes, but to be able to, to go forth and take those things with us. Father, we just pray again for the things that are going on in our communities, in our cities, in our country, and in our world. We just pray, Father, that this thing can soon come to a swift end and that peace can be restored from that standpoint. Father, we just pray for those who are uh, giving care to those who are sick, giving care to those who are very vulnerable. We pray, Father, for safe travels and safety for them and for their families. Father, we just pray for those groups who are susceptible to this disease. We pray, Father, that you'll be able to, to or know you're able, but if it be your will to be able to keep them safe, and we just pray, Father, for healing for those. We know, Father, we have those of our number who are having some difficult times in the midst of all this with surgeries um, that are going on. We just pray in a very special way that you'll be with them. We pray for the, the Lovell family and the surgery that's going on uh, with uh, Keith Lovell. We just pray, Father, in a very special way that you will be with them and, and provide healing, um, continued healing for him. Father, we just pray for the family that Brother Blake Dees has talked about he lost a son to an uh, automobile accident and others who are in critical condition. We just pray, Father, that you'll be with them and, and bless them. Father, we just pray that you'll help us to be your eyes and your hands and your feet, to be able to take um, peace to a world that needs it, to take salvation to a world that so desperately needs it as well. Father, forgive us where we fail thee. Through Christ's name we pray. Amen. If I mention the name Jethro, what do you guys think about as far as that character? And I think the devil is in my PowerPoint this afternoon. Apologize for that. There we go. When you think about Jethro, do you think about this guy here, perhaps? Uh, a very popular television series, and then maybe, maybe that's the guy you think about when I mention the name Jethro. Or maybe even this guy from a few years before the other show. 
But that's not the characters that I'm talking about. Uh, even though these other guys probably have more notoriety than the one that we're going to study this afternoon. I'm talking, of course, about the father-in-law of Moses. His name was Jethro. At least his Hebrew name was Jethro. Other scriptural references also calls him Ruel, a Ragel, is also names that were given for him. That name, Jethro, is a Hebrew name that was bestowed on him. And that name means excellence or abundance. Perhaps he was renamed Jethro in Hebrew just because of his characteristics. Because it's, as we'll see him, as we study him this afternoon, it was evidently something that really described Jethro. He was a remarkable man. So as we're thinking about those who were or have nicknames or have other names that are given to us that Jethro's not the only one that we see that happening to. Can you think of some other names that throughout the Bible we see the folks who have been renamed? Well, one of them that comes to mind is Abram. God renamed Abram Abraham based on that promise that he made to him that he fulfilled. His wife, Sarah, was also renamed. He called her Sarah. Jacob, his name was changed by God to Israel. We think about that perhaps in the New Testament, Simon or Cephas, well, he was renamed Peter. And we know what Peter means is a pebble or a stone. Uh, other names that we can think of, the apostles renamed a man by the name of Joseph. They renamed him Barnabas or the son of encouragement. What uh, is usually happening when we see these names renamed or nicknames, perhaps even in our society today, when we give somebody a nickname, it's usually based on a characteristic, right? Some kind of characteristic about that person. And Jethro, we see by the things that we're going to study, he was no different. That name Jethro really does fit him well. One of the first things that I we consider about him is the introduction that the Bible gives us to Jethro. Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. We see that that passage of Scripture begins with Moses having that confrontation with that Egyptian. Who, that he killed that Egyptian over the treatment of the Israelite slave. And as a result of that, Moses flees to the land of Midian. He found refuge there in that land of Midian. He was a refugee all along in a strange land among people whose culture was different, whose religious views were different. They were different from the Israelites and they were different from the Egyptians. And that would soon, well, that would soon change. Let's look and see beginning in verse 16. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to read along with me out of your Bible. Let's look at the beginning of uh, chapter 2 and verse 16, down through about verse 22. All right? Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. And then they came to Ruel, their father, and he said, How is it that you come so soon this day? And they said, There was an Egyptian who delivered us out of the hands of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. And he said to his daughters, Where is he? And where is it? And why have you left this man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses Zipporah, his daughter. And she bore him a son, and he called his name Gershom. For he said, I've been a stranger in a strange land. So how did Moses come to know Jethro? How did he come to know Jethro? Well, it says in this passage that we just read, there was a priest, and this is talking about Jethro, a priest in Midian 
who had these seven daughters. These seven daughters obviously had a task to perform. They were to go and draw water for the herd. So they went down to the well where Moses was nearby, and they, was, they were trying to fill that trough. Tros, then there came other shepherds who, who tried to run them away from the, from the water source there. But Moses stepped in, and he helped them. He obviously drove away those, those shepherds or, or, or talked them out of the way or, or talked them away from doing what they were doing or some way he got rid of those guys. And, and so we see him not only he did that, but he falls in and he helps them out. So he, he helps them out. They start back home. As they get back home, their father says, what are you doing back so soon? He knew it should have taken them longer. So they tell him the story about this man named Moses. Notice the text says that he was an Egyptian. Obviously, he looked like and dressed like and talked like an Egyptian. He was born uh, an Israelite and is an Israelite, but he was an Israelite in the land of Egypt, and he was raised, remember, in the Pharaoh's house. And so all indication was at this time he, he looked like, acted like, talked like an Egyptian. And so the father says to him, where is he? Go get him. We need to, to pay uh, honor to this man. We need to have him share bread with us. And so they went and fetched him. And Moses obviously well, felt comfortable in this land with, with Jethro and with his family. He felt like it was something that he could stay there. Verse 21 says he was content to dwell with this man. Obviously, Moses saw something good in the priest there at Midian. And the man saw something good in Moses. Jethro gave him one of his daughters, Zipporah. They had a son. So this is how Moses and Jethro started interaction there. So what is insightful about what we see about this introduction to uh, Jethro? What does it tell us about his character? Well, obviously one of the first things we can see about um, and think about when you think about Jethro, he's obviously a kind man. Now, he didn't just uh, take for granted that uh, someone had stepped in and helped out. Uh, he wanted to make sure that that man was rewarded for his deed. He was obviously a, a, a good man when he, uh, and also a, a, a smart man. He was uh, obviously a leader among his people. Uh, he had obviously run a household and had a herds of animals that, that were to take care of. And so uh, being a, a priest of the Midianites, uh, he, he probably was some, he was a, obviously a leader. And so we see he's a good man. He was a, a, a smart man, a leader. And he was a person who was insightful about other people. Uh, he got to know Moses and figured out pretty quickly, obviously, that he was a good person. And he offered one of his daughters for Moses to marry. Uh, in, in addition to marrying one of Jethro's daughters, what does Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1 tell us that Moses did for Jethro? Let's look at uh, chapter 3 in verse 1. Now, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and he came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Now remember what's fixing to happen there. Uh, he's fixing to have this vision, this, this very physical thing happen, this burning bush and this voice from God, this conversation is about to take place. But what does chapter three and verse one tell us? He worked for his father-in-law. He kept his herds. He took care of those things for him. What does it call Jethro there again? He calls him a priest of Midian. When we consider the fact that Moses is, or, or that Jethro is a priest, what can we assume about his religion? Well, as with many other religions, all other religions in that area, they were polytheists. They believed in worshiping a multitude of gods. So 
this was probably the, and, and history tells us this is the case with the Midianites. Uh, so he was a Midianite priest. Obviously, he was one that, that worshipped many, many types of gods. And we're going to see that as we unfold our lesson and read in the scriptures uh, as we continue there. The next thing that we consider about Jethro is found in chapter 2 and verses 15 through 20. He was obviously, as we, we, we thought about when we first met Jethro and where we talked about him, he was obviously a man who was pretty wise. Let's read verse 15. Uh, we've already read verses 15 through 20. Let's back up one chapter and look at verse 18. Moses had a very deep respect and admiration for his father-in-law. After we see this divine marching order that he's been given into the desert, he comes back in chapter 4 and verse 18. He comes back to his father-in-law to ask a very important question of him. It says that he went, returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and he said to him, Let me go, I pray thee, and return unto my brethren which are in Egypt, and see whether they be yet alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. What was that question that Moses asked his father-in-law? Basically, can I leave here? I know I work for you. I know that I have a home here and a family here, but will you let me go? Will you loose me to be able to go back to this place to, um, to be able to see if my brethren be alive or not? What's going on at this point is that for the better part of 40 years, think about that, for 40 years now, Jethro has been sort of like a son, or, or Moses has been sort of like a son to Jethro. Now, not only does he want to return to the land where that ruler sought to kill him, uh, chapter 2, verse 15, he wants to take his family with him, which is Jethro's daughter, and that son that we read about there. And so with this in mind, with this in mind, what does Jethro's response to Moses' request reveal about Jethro? Think about that just for a second. Forty years he's been like a son to, to, uh, to Jethro. To, uh, Moses has been like a son to Jethro. Forty years he's worked for him. And so with this request, can I go back and I go check on these people? He tells him, go in peace. He obviously believed there was something, something there that he needed to go take care of. And he was willing to let him go and do that. It tells us a lot about Jethro and, and some things about his faith. We're going to see more about that as we look at this little next part here. Jethro comes to visit. Now this is after Moses and the Israelite has, have escaped the Egyptian. Um, Jethro comes to, to visit Moses at the Mount of God. And, and so he's bringing Zipporah and her two sons with him at this point. And so we see this interaction take place here that really gives us some more insight as to who Jethro is and what kind of person that he is. Let's look chapter 18 down in verse 10 beginning. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord, who hath delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of Pharaoh, and who hath delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, for in the thing wherein they dealt proudly as he was above them. And Jethro Moses' father-in-law took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. And Aaron came and all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. When Moses tells him what's taking place, what tells Jethro what's taking place and what the Lord has done for them, 
What was his reaction as we see back in verses 10 and 11? He says, verse 11, now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. For the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. You see, based on Jethro's statement back in verse 11, I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. We can say something very interesting about his character. The fact is, he being polytheistic, being one who worshiped many gods, he was willing to make a, a statement there from the heart. He was willing to understand and, and be able to say, I see this. I see this. Now, what can we glean from that today? Well, the fact remains that, that religious traditions can be one of the hardest hurdles to overcome. It can blind us from the truth. It can make things that seem reasonable seem unreasonable in our eyes. And you take this man who was not only just a, a person, a, a, a believer in what he was, um, what was going on in the Midianite with the Midianites. He was one who was a, a teacher. He was a preacher. He was one of those holy men of the Midianites. He was one who led those things, led those discussions, those, those uh, sermons, if you will, those, those ceremonies for those many gods. But he said, I see it. I understand, and I believe it. And so he makes sacrifices. He makes sacrifices to the one God. There is some great things that we can see from the heart of Jethro. And, and, and I hope that it's something that we can take and as we share with other people, we can share the story about Jethro and how the tradition wasn't something that held him back when he saw the truth. He was willing to say, this is, this is what it is. He, it was something that was simple for him to see and to respond to. And, and folks, God's truth is not complicated, is it? God's truth is what it is. It is the truth. And Jesus says that truth can set you free. We've got to listen to it. We've got to say what, what the, the Holy Spirit has given to us through this word and take it for what it says and live by it. Think about some traditions of man and how they can hinder God's truth from setting men free. Folks, we can't be like that. We've got to let God's word be the teacher and us be the students. We've got to let God's truth be what it is because it is truth. It is held up itself, and that truth can set us free. Yes, Jethro was a, was a smart guy. And finally, as we think about some characteristics of Jethro, we see that he's not through giving us some pearls of wisdom. He wasn't through giving those pearls to, to Moses, and he's not through giving them to us as well today. Let's go on down to verses 19 through 21 of uh, Exodus chapter 18. So he is observed. He's came in. He's, he has offered sacrifices to, to God. He says, I see it. I understand it. And then he makes some observation as far as the way things are, are being dealt with, as far as Moses and the leadership role that he's having to be forced into. And he's offering some, some advice to his son-in-law. He says, beginning in verse 19, Now, hearken to my voice. I'm going to give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Now, I'm going to stop right there. Now, folks, the best kind of counsel that we can give is that God's going to be with you if you do this. God's going to be with you and bless you. He's with you and he's blessing you now. And if you'll heed this advice, God's going to bless you in it. He says, I'm going to give you counsel. God's going to be with you. Be thou for the people to God work. And mayest bring the causes unto God. 
Now, verse 20. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws and to show them the way wherein they must walk or walk and the work that they must do. Now, where did he say that's going to be? He's going to say, you're going to teach them these things, but you're going to teach them these things because God's going to bless it. You're going to teach these, these th teach them these things because the, the people, by listening to what you say, God's going to continue to bless them. Moreover, verse 21, thou shalt provide all out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of the thousands and rulers of the hundreds and rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. Now, when Moses had led the people out of Egypt, there was approximately 600,000 men of fighting age, along with their wives, the women, children, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 37. All day long, could you imagine? All day long, every day, for a whole lot of weeks, he's been in this wilderness with these people, and he's constantly having to be the judge. The judge over conflicts, over disputes. It's obvious that he's wearing himself out. He's been doing this from early morning until late at night, and Jethro sees that in his son-in-law. And it's obvious that the people aren't happy because they're not getting those answers that, that in an expedited way like they'd like it. They're just like us. We want it. We want it right now. And so it's wearing them out too. So Jethro watches what's going on. And he tells him, this is not good. What's going on with you is not good. Moses, he says, you need help. So what was his advice to Moses? Now, he tells him, he says, you find you some men. And he doesn't just say just to some warm bodies. He gets specific of what kind of men. And I want you to listen to his description. Let's look at it together. Able men. Capable. I mean good people. Capable people. Capable men. Men of truth. Men who hate covetousness. Now, let's think about what all these things say. And let's make some application in what, he's, uh, what he is telling him versus what God through the Holy Spirit has set up to be the structure of the church today. Who's the head of the church? Well, Christ is the head of the church. But he also, by the same token of this person you can't handle it all. There's got to be some kind of an organizational structure there, but it can't just be anybody. He says there's going to have to be some specific things that these folks are going to have to go by that will qualify them to be these people. And let's think about what uh, those qualifications was that Jethro talked about. they are got to be able men. So in other words, the things that they're going to be dealing with, they're going to need to be able to have the ability to, to discern some things. They're going to have to have some, some uh, experience in some matters. They're going to have to show by example, perhaps, that they've been able to handle situations. Well, isn't that some of the qualifications for elders? That has to be able to take care of certain responsibilities and have certain experiences and, and show by example those things. So you're going to have to find your able men, Moses. Men of truth was the other thing that he said. Again, for those qualifications for elders that's laying out in the New Testament there, you're not going to be having to, you can't have novices in there. It says you can't be having someone who's a, who's a novice. They're going to have to have some, by, by their experience, 
by their study. They're going to have to be people who are grounded in the truth and people who hate covetousness. That third one right there. Isn't that, again, some of the things we see in the New Testament for qualifications for eldership? It is that they're going to have to be people that's not in it for the wrong reasons, you know? So the decisions that they make is not going to be based on the wrong reasons. I think specifically in, in, the, in the qualification that says not guilty of filthy lucre. So that advice that Jethro gave all those thousands of years ago was pretty sharp, wasn't it? When he led those people... He, Jethro saw that he couldn't do it by himself. And he said, this is not good. You need to do this. Moses, you need some help. Boy, he gave him some great advice, didn't he? You see, here's another thing I don't want us to miss. Take it with us. We need to consider that God has never designed us to work alone. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18 he says, the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a help that's meet for him. And of course, we know that story of how that Eve was formed and became that, that helper for Adam, that one who was able to help in the decisions, the one that was able to, to help in the and uh, have the interaction and the communication to help make some decisions. And they didn't always make good decisions as we read on in there. But God has never designed man to be a hermit. We've always needed help. Now, when it comes to the greatest responsibility that we can have as Christians to take the gospel into a world that needs it so desperately, why would we feel, why could we possibly feel that it needs to fall on the hands of one person? Well, well, the, the preacher can take care of this. That's his job. Oh, no, no, no. That's not, what, that's not what the design is. It's our responsibility. We are all ministers. We all have the responsibility to go out into the world to preach the gospel to every creature, to encourage one another it's not something that's even possible for a person to do by himself. And so many times we see, we see congregations fail because they fail to see the importance of it being more than just one or two person's responsibilities. God never designed us to work alone. The next one I want us to consider is what Jesus did in Mark chapter 6 and verse 7. He called unto the twelve, and he began to send them, forth, send them forth two by two. He gave them power over unclean spirits. How did he send them out to be able to preach the, the, the kingdom was coming? He didn't send them out by themselves. He sent them out two by two. He sent them out in, in at least by pairs. Because what does it say in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 10? For if they fall... One will lift up his fellow. Woe unto him that is alone, though, when he falls, for he hath not another to help him up. Down in verse 12 of Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And if one prevails against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. What are some of the reasons given in these two verses as to why we must work together? Well, because if one falls down, another can pick him up. I'm going to tell you what, one of the most powerful tools that the devil has in his arsenal is, is discouragement. And it's easy for us to be discouraged. It's easy for us to take something and let it work on us. We go far beyond when the event happened or when the thing happened and we tend to, and I'm speaking to myself too, we tend to sleep on that. And we wallow that around like a cow chewing its cud. And, and that really, that, that, that ability of, for deception of, of discouragement, oh, it can, it can kill us. He says if a man falls down and he's not alone, he's got somebody else to pick him up. 
I'll tell you, it's so important to have that Barnabas. And one person doesn't have to be that Barnabas all the time. The, the, the whole point is that person gets up, the other or that person gets down, the other one's there to encourage him to tell him it's going to be okay. It's going to be good. It's worth the fight. Keep on fighting. And that next situation might be where the other one's falling. And then the other one says, you know, we've got to get up and keep on going. It's important. It's that important. Down in verse 12, well, it's another reason that we must work together. If one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Going hand in hand with just that, that uh, uh, downhearted nature that we can get is we can actually be defeated from time to time. Or we can get beat down. They can someone come at us and, and defame us or, or, or say something to us that does more than discourage us that can actually do us harm. And that's not the way that that's not the way that folks ought to treat each other, but it's the reality. But if we have some folks that are working together and they know you, then they can come to your aid. They can come to your defense and say, look, I I seen and I know better. So that's the importance. That's what Jethro, that wise guy, saw that his son-in-law needed was some help. And as we go forth in a world that needs the gospel message in a, in a, a society where the, 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 the number one thing to do is to divide people, to put them in categories, we need a, a group of people to say that's not God's way. We need a group of people to say that in God, all of us have an opportunity that will listen and obey. All of us are worthy to have an eternity with God in heaven. Folks, I'm going to leave you with that lesson tonight. I don't have to do a part two of it, but I appreciate the little extra time it took to get all this out in one, one lesson tonight. I appreciate so much the comments again and and if you have any more questions, if you'd like to set up a study, we'll do that. Please let me know. Let me know when's convenient for you. We'll do that. We'll sit down with God's truth. We'll walk through some things together. We'll ask those questions together of God's word. Please help us to, to get that word out to, to folks. Please listen to what Jethro said to his son-in-law, Moses. And, and let's work together, not a not depend on one person to be that that person that does all the things we don't never see an army who has ever been successful or any kind of military force that would sit back and let one person go out and do all the fighting for them it's not going to work like that let's pray and then we'll let the lesson be yours for the week shall we our holy father in heaven we thank you for this opportunity we pray father as we study a character such as um Jethro, that you'll help us to see and understand uh, the wisdom in this advice, that to work together, to reach out together to a world that so desperately needs to hear the truth, the world that so desperately needs to, to hear that someone cares about them so much, that, that loves them so much, and is willing to, to share themselves with them and, and share the truth with them. Father, we just pray and thank you so much for that opportunity. And we just pray, Father, that you'll help us to work together to, to be able to make that opportunity uh, something that, that's very fruitful. Forgive us for we fail thee. We pray these things through Christ's name. Amen.